Hey guys, welcome back. My name is Joe Ellis. I'm a commercial wedding and portrait photographer in Dallas, Texas. And today we're talking about the Olympus EM1X. So I thought it'd be really fun to go through a couple of things. Number one is sort of my top five reasons why you might consider getting an EM1X, especially if you're an EM1 Mark II shooter or you're trying to upgrade from another Olympus camera. And then the other thing is about 14 customizations that I made to the camera for use in my work, shooting people, shooting events, things like that. So uh, strap in, let's get into it. All right, so the first thing here is um, my top five reasons, okay? And so these are the top five things that have kind of hit me over the last number of weeks shooting the camera as reasons why you might consider upgrading. And the first one is uh, autofocus. And I think that kind of comes in three parts. The first one is low light acquisition. So if you are someone who shoots in low light a lot like I do, and we're talking about ISOs of like 3200 and 6400, uh, type of deals, then you're going to notice a big improvement in the camera's ability to kind of acquire focus in those super dark scenarios. And uh, it's not that the EM1 Mark II was ever bad in this regard, but the EM1X takes it to the next level. And just the ability to kind of grab onto a high contrast area in that super, super low light environment. The second part is um, continuous autofocus. And again, I see the biggest improvement in low light. I always thought the M1 Mark II did a great job here, but if you look at like low, low light dancing pictures or maybe a church that's underlit where they're walking back up the aisle in the dark and I'm shooting wide open at 1.8 or 1.2 and I'm watching the couple kind of come towards me, um, you know, the M1 Mark II would probably get 75, 80% of those in focus. And I always thought that was a great job because I had tons of pictures to choose from but the EM1X is getting closer to 90 or 95% of those, maybe even a little bit higher. So just the ability to kind of, uh, you know, follow something and lock onto something and just be really sticky in that regard, the EM1X is definitely a bump up from the EM1 Mark II. The third piece of autofocus is video autofocus. And if you turn on face detect and continuous autofocus on the EM1X, it gives you a level uh, gives you a performance that I call both sticky and smooth. It's sticky in the sense that it will stick with someone's face. If I am videotaping and they are moving this way and back and forward and that way, the camera will very smoothly stick with them as they're uh, kind of being recorded. And it's a really, really wonderful tool to have in your hands when you're like a, a one man gun, run and gun kind of video situation. Also, if you're recording yourself and you have, uh, and I'm like, I'm in frame and then I put something else in front of the camera and then, it, and then I remove it, it will actually go between me and that object very smoothly and easily. And I'm going to show that to you guys here in an upcoming video. But suffice to say that it's definitely been a huge improvement in the workflow of uh, taking video as a one man show. Okay, so that's autofocus. The second thing is ergonomics. Um, and it kind of comes in a few different ways, but I love the... Uh, <clears throat> The size and placement of the buttons on this camera is definitely a little bit bigger um, than the EM1 Mark II, so it's a little easier to kind of have that separation between different buttons. Um, I like that many of the buttons are textured, so that it's very easy to tell what you're pushing when the camera's up to your eye. And then third, <clears throat> sorry guys, the EM1X has these joysticks on the back. And the joystick is really amazing because it just allows you another tool for moving that focus point around really quickly and easily. And these joysticks not only move the focus point left and right, but also diagonally. And then uh, kind of couple that up with one more feature, and that is you can actually use a punch in on the button to do yet another function. And so I find all of these tools just kind of increase the ergonomics and the um, operability of the camera, the speed of the camera while you're working with it. Okay, the, th the fourth reason is the battery configuration. So with the EM1 Mark II with a grip on, the thing was you had to have one uh, battery in the camera and one in the grip. And so uh, consequently, I always um, just used one camera, one battery in the grip and did never put a battery into the camera body itself. And that's because I never wanted to have to unscrew the grip to get at it when I was working an event. So with these batteries here, they're actually on a tray and they're both located at the bottom of the camera. And that's actually been much easier to have the two batteries working at the same time. I will also tell you from a battery perspective, after working a few events with these, that um, at the end of the night, I found I've actually used less batteries overall running two EM1Xs than I did two EM1 Mark IIs. 
So I don't know if it's the conjunction of both batteries or if these are just a little bit more efficient in that regard, but for whatever reason, I'm using a little bit less battery power than I did with the EM1 Mark IIs. And the last reason is the new tech. So this camera is full of new tech from handheld high res to live ND, to the ability to tether wirelessly, uh, send raw files over Wi-Fi, um, and you know, I'm sure there's a few others I'm not thinking of right now, but some of these new tech features could be um, deal makers for you. They could be something that's just really, really um, important part of your shooting style and what you're trying to get at in terms of subjects and, and workflow. So if one of those things is really um, key to your work, then maybe that'd be a great reason to upgrade to an EM1X. For me, um, it, it was the autofocus and the ergonomics, um, the durability of the cameras, the, all those kinds of things kind of add up to making it worth it. Okay, and so those are kind of my five reasons, uh, at least over the last few weeks that I thought, oh man, that's a really great reason to upgrade to the EM1X. But let's say you've got one of these bad boys and you're kind of looking for a little bit of help here in terms of how I might have set it up. I kind of want to go through like, I think I've got 14 different things I'm going to talk about that are just um, ideas that you could think about how you want to set the camera up. But these are kind of ways that I've customized it to be a little bit faster and a little bit easier on me. Um, but before I even get there, I want to mention something brand new to these cameras if you've never seen it before. And that is these little um, custom menus. So they're called My Menus, and it just allows you to store as many of your favorite settings under one menu header, and always be able to go back to just those settings without having to go through the rest of the camera. So there are these little stars, and I believe there's five of them available to you. And so all you have to do to use one of these is pick anything, like let's say bracketing, with something you want to have in your My Menu. You highlight it on any one of the menus, and then you hit the Video Record button on the camera, and it will ask you if you want to put it in any one of five My Menu banks. And this is really neat because if you have something that is, um, previously was, you know, buried in two or three menus or whatever, and you used to access it pretty frequently, so you'd memorize to where it was, but it still took five or six button presses to get there. Now you're down to just one or two because they would be stored right there in your My Menu. Okay. So let's go through this. Um, the first thing is that I always shoot all of my Olympus cameras in the muted picture profile. And I do that because I really wanted to mimic as close as possible the raw file in terms of the amount of information that's been captured, um, the uh, contrast and uh, saturation that there is in the raw file to begin with. Uh, and that's because I shoot RAWs to my card one and JPEGs to my card two as my backups. So I want to have as malleable, as editable a JPEG as I possibly can, should I ever need to go to it. And when I'm looking at previews on the back of the camera, I want the two pictures to match as closely as I can. So if you want to shoot the muted picture profile, you would just go to camera one and to picture mode. And then I choose muted. If you want to go standard muted, you can. If you right screen over, you can actually define what the muted profile is. And for me, I turned down the contrast to minus one. You could go even further to minus two. This makes for a very flat JPEG. Okay, the next thing um, that I would customize is the back button focus. And this is always a somewhat controversial topic. Um, and I think both ways can work really well. But for me, over the years of shooting, I find back button focus to be extremely beneficial just in terms of my ability to um, you know, decouple the shutter button from doing any autofocus work means that I can pump my autofocus button, the AEL, AFL button, whenever I want to. And whenever I touch the shutter, it will always, always just do one thing and that is fire the camera. So to set up the back button focus, you would just go into, um, let me make sure I got this right. A1, yep, A1, and then down to AEL, AFL. That defines what that button does. And what you'd wanna do is set SAF and CAF to respectively mode three for SAF, mode four for CAF. And then crucially with the EM1X, you need to go down to the uh, halfway AF option. And this actually defines what the shutter button does in all of the modes. And that is that <clears throat> you wanna go ahead and turn off its autofocus. So a halfway AF set to inoperative. Okay, um, so the next thing is the linked orientation point. And that's under A2. And what this option does is it actually will remember where your autofocus point is in the horizontal orientation and where it is in the vertical orientation. So let's say you're shooting pictures and you've got your, your focus point kind of high center in your shooting pictures and then you wanna to switch to vertical. Well, in vertical, you're probably gonna want that same focus point sort of high center. So let's say you had your focus point over here last time you were shooting verticals, as I typically do. And then when I flip the camera vertical, the focus point automatically jumps from there 
to there. So that way I don't have to, um, you know, scroll it over or move it as I'm working. It's that much faster. So um, for me, I always tend to have my focus point high center because I don't want to um, have, uh, you know, people right in the middle of the frame. And the same thing goes for the vertical orient orientation. I usually have it high center on the vertical side. So for me, this is a time saver because it always gets me close to where I want to go without having to do any extra moving of the focus point from one area to the other. So that's a linked orientation point. And if you didn't like that, you could decouple it and have it do something completely different in terms of modes or uh, you know, where it's located and all that kind of good stuff. So um, that's linked orientation point. Okay, uh, next. The clutch, okay. <laughs> so the manual focus clutch. So a lot of Olympus's pro cameras, or pro lenses, and even some of their premium line have a focus clutch mechanism. And what this is, is that if you pull it back, this puts the camera into manual focus and you push it forward and it's an autofocus. And it's a source of a lot of confusion for people picking up the system for the first time because they will trip that and not know why their camera won't autofocus. Well, for me, you know, over the years, of course, I've, I've, it's always on top of my mind is one of the reasons why the camera might not autofocus. But the point is that for me is that um, that will oftentimes get tripped when the camera's on my hip because I'm constantly shooting with two camera bodies. So for me, I turn this feature off. And I know that a lot of photographers love to kind of use man, um, autofocus and then go ahead and, and um, trip the clutch and then use manual focus for fine tuning or for holding focus. And if that is your game, then I think that's awesome. Um, but for me, I never want to bring the camera up to my face from my hip and have it be in manual focus and me not know it. So for that reason, I have turned off my focus clutch. Okay, so all we have to do to turn that off is just go into Focus clutch is A4, and I've set it to inoperative. So pretty easy. Uh, definitely, uh, you know, it depends on you. I will tell you that if you do this and you turn it into inoperative, if you are shooting and you still want to get to manual focus, you don't have to go in and turn that back on. You can actually just go into the menus and then change it from SAF to M and then you would just turn the focus ring and you could manually focus. So, you know, for me, it's, I would rather have it be buried in a couple of menus so that it doesn't accidentally get tripped rather than have it be something that's so quick and easy for me to access because, um, you know, honestly speaking, I'm only gonna manual focus 1% or less of the time. Okay, um, okay, so instant continuous autofocus. Okay, so the, all of, both the EM1, um, Mark II and the EM1X have this little FN lever where it says position one and position two. And I love this little switch because what I use it for is changing between uh, single AF and continuous AF. And so very quickly and easily with the camera in my hand, I can hit that little switch and then I will go from SAF to CAF. And so to change this, um, to get this working, you only have to do a couple of things. The first one is you gotta define what the switch does. So we'll go down to uh, FN lever function, which is in gear B1, and then FN lever function should be set to mode two. And what mode two is defined as, if you go look at it, is it will say switches AF mode and AF target mode. So that works great. And so now all you have to do if you're in mode one is switch to mode two. And I already had it set it for CAF, but when the camera comes to you de by default, when you turn it on, I believe mode two will be manual focus. So the first time you flip it to mode two, just go into your super control panel, change it to CAF. I really like having the five focus points and then um, set it there. And then if you go back to mode one, you'll be in, uh, oops, I had it set to manual focus, but normally you'd be in SAF. I'll go ahead and put it there. And then if I go to mode two, continuous autofocus. Mode one, single autofocus. Now it's important to note that both of these modes are sticky, not absolute. So if you move to mode two and you put it in manual focus and flip back to mode one, when you come back to mode two, you're still gonna be in manual focus. So they are wherever you set them last. Uh, I don't tend to ever change these settings. So for me, this works great. Mode one, SAF, mode two, CAF. And so that's a really quick and easy one for me. Okay. Um, so I talked about the little joysticks on the back of the camera and there's two of them here. Uh, absolutely fantastic tool. And the punch in of that um, joystick for me is return to home position for the AF point. So to define that, what I would do is go into here, which is again, B1. 
and then center button. And I have it set for home point of my autofocus. And so what that means is that if I'm way off in the corner somewhere focusing on something and I punch this button, it will return to the middle. And so if you are working on a composition over here and you're getting some really great and it's way off center and then you turn and something great is going on in front of the camera, a simple punch of that button gets me right back to the middle, gets me shooting quickly again. So you can define your home point as to wherever you might want it to be. Um, but for me, the middle works fine. And I love that sort of like quick reset that I have just by punching the joystick. Okay. Um, okay. So I grew up in a time when, uh, believe it or not, there were actually aperture rings on cameras. And so usually with your left hand, you would change the aperture ring, uh, change the aperture of the lens. And with your right hand, you would change your shutter speed. And so for that reason, I got really used to my front dial being my shutter speed. And so when back dials came along, I made those my f-stop. And so one of the things I love most about Olympus cameras, again, is just how customizable they are to us. And so one of the things that I've always done is switched the uh, shutter speed and aperture sort of default. And if that's you or you're looking for a way to kind of change the way the dial spins or you're changing where those aperture and shutter speed dials are, you can easily do that. Um, and that would be under dial function. And then you just would define it for like me for manual. I change the shutter to the front and the F number to the back. And you can change directions and all kinds of stuff in here too. But for me, those were fine. But again, that is um, just one little tweak you can make that kind of make things make more sense in your head or make your muscle memory work that much faster. Okay, um, so that was that, let's see. Okay, custom buttons. So let's get into a couple little custom buttons. Um, so again, we're in B1 and we're gonna go into button function, which is a big menu. Um, and what I love about this now is we have this little graphical interface here where we actually get to see the camera and it'll actually show you which button you're customizing. So for me as a manual, a manual exposure photographer, which is what I do 99.9% .9 of the time, um, I don't use the exposure compensation switch uh, or button very often, if ever. And so what I have actually defined that to be is my SOVF button. SOVF again is simulated optical viewfinder. So this is the button that I use when I'm using flash and flash is something I do a lot. So if I'm going to underexpose the ambient because I'm using a strobe, I oftentimes want to decouple what the viewfinder is seeing from what the exposure of the camera is. And SOVF will do that for me. And I like to have it right there on a button because it's just that much quicker to change between the two if I'm shooting ambient and then choosing to shoot strobe, so on and so forth. So the first thing I did is define here on top of the camera, the button next to the ISO to be my SOVF. The only other button that I've uh, customized on this camera so far, because they did such a great job of laying it out kind of logically the way I would like it, is one of the custom buttons on the front of the camera, the ones that's kind of under the grip, kind of right in here. So the bottom one is the depth of field preview. I don't use that very often, but the top one I do use quite a bit, and I've changed that to white balance. So if I get back in here, button function, and we scroll so we're looking at the front of the camera, the top one I changed to white balance. And so here's the only thing I would tell you about some of these modes, and that is that um, as you're defining your custom buttons, make sure that what you're choosing to go under those buttons is nothing that's going to slow you down from taking a picture. One of the options in there, for example, is to create a custom white balance, which is like a two or three step process in terms of you got to hit the button, you got to take an exposure of something white, then you got to confirm it. That can throw you off if you hit it accidentally, at least in my mind. So I always want to streamline all the buttons that I have in the camera to be things that aren't ever going to slow me down. And so I don't mind, for example, making a custom white balance a little bit slower by having to go into a menu rather than having it be a key on the camera. So again, word to the wise on that one, set it up whatever way you like it. For me, I like having the white balance on the front of the camera under my index finger, under my uh, ring finger, because I really want to be able to do that one handed. So for me, I'm just gripping the camera here. I trip that button and then I can make a white balance adjustment and I don't have to reach with the second hand back to the white balance button they have dedicated here on the back. Sometimes this button works great. If I'm looking down, making some adjustments, getting ready to shoot, I will often use this white balance button to make that adjustment. If I already have the camera up to my face and I'm sort of tweaking, let's say a Kelvin value, trying to get a good look at what the colors look like, then I like having that under my other finger. So uh, that's that one. And those are the two kind of custom buttons that I had to set up so far. Um, another one that I set up that is uh, came from a firmware update in the M1 Mark II is the ability for the camera to quickly jump to 100% um, magnification when you're reviewing photos. So by default, it's actually not set to that. But if we go into D2, so gear menu D2, 
you'll find um, this playback magnify default setting. And this is one you want to have to equally value. And so what happens is you'll hit review, you'll look at a photograph, you'll go to magnify it once, and instead of making a small increment jump, it'll actually jump straight to 100% so you can get a view uh, at that perfect magnification and check your sharpness. So equally value. Okay, the next one is the beep, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, by default, the beep is usually on. It's in D4. If you like having a beep each time the camera confirms autofocus, um, which some photographers do, then you would definitely want to leave this on. But for me, trying to be as stealth as possible, I kind of turn off as many noises as I possibly can. So in this case, I take the sound and you turn it off. Um, okay, another one is the linked white balance and flash. So if we go to F, you'll find this setting here, which is flash plus white balance. And what I want to do with this setting is make sure that it's off. Uh, if I am using color corrective gels or I'm trying to do something with the color of the light coming out of my flash, this will mess you up. What this setting will do if it's turned on is it will automatically put the camera into flash white balance as soon as it detects a flash on the top of the camera. Um, and you know, I am more than happy just to go ahead and set that white balance as I'm shooting rather than having it do it automatically. If you are, um, you know, not going to be doing a lot of creative things with color or not worried about it, or you generally just kind of point your flash forward for fill, then maybe having that on would be a great feature. But for me, I prefer to have it off. Okay, um, keep warm color is another one that comes by default on. And um, keep warm color means that in auto white balance, the camera will bias for warm tones. And so um, it's in G. And to be honest with you, I really like Olympus colors and I really like their sort of neutral colors. So I turn keep warm color off. So if you um, can play around with this and see what you think, but for me, um, turning this off just means I'm getting more neutral, more natural colors than I would um, the other way. And bear in mind, this only works, this only really is a concern with auto white balance, um, which is not a setting I use all the time, but I hate being thrown off by having the camera bias the color one way or the other automatically. Okay, uh, copyright. So that's another good one. Um, if you have an EM1 Mark II or an EM1X, you can actually have the copyright set in here um, automatically. And you could do this on uh, ingest if you wanted to, but uh, I like having it in both places. That way it's already on my um, JPEGs, for example. And it's just right there under H1, copyright settings. And here I can put the artist name, I can put the copyright name, and it's already embedded into each of the files. And like I said, you know, I tend to probably overwrite this when I put it in Lightroom um, with a little bit more information. But if it's my JPEGs, for example, then I usually don't ever deal with those. So if I ever needed them or if everybody, anyone ever got a hold of one, then there would already be some copyright information on there. And let's see, uh, the last thing is my dual card setup. So if you are shooting a dual card camera for the first time or you're um, getting into shooting events, uh, I like to use um, two cards in the camera all the time. And the setting that I use here is called uh, dual independent. And in, in Olympus cameras, dual independent means that both cards are operating independently. And when one of them becomes full, the camera will alert you to put a new card in. And what that means is that there's no overflow, there's no writing to the other card um, automatically. And that will keep you from, like keep your raw files and your JPEG files or your first set of files separate from your second set of files. So when I'm shooting a wedding, I have a, a dedicated card that captures the entire day on JPEG. It never comes out of the camera. And then my raw files, I may or may not have to change cards, um, but those are completely separate from my JPEG files. So that's set for dual independent. I think that's a really great feature and probably the one that would be the default in my mind for how you would actually want this to behave if your second card is a backup card. If it is your video card or if it's an overflow card, then you would set it up differently. But for me, dual independent works best. So those are my 14 setting guides. I'm gonna list this all out in the description below this video so you can look at these individually and I'll have the little uh, codes for how to access each of them. Um, you know, I've shot a few thousand pictures with both of these cameras and I'd say they're behaving really, really great. Um, it really feels like a very polished product um, for the most part. And I really think the upgrades are stuff that um, E1 Mark II shooters would find very, very nice and very, very helpful in their work. So if you have the wherewithal, if it's within the budget, if it feels like the right thing to do, 
then I think the EM1X is a great upgrade for you in the Olympus system. If ultimate size is still like your, your number one factor in terms of picking a camera, the EM1 Mark II makes the almost the exact same photograph, is still a hugely capable machine, and I wouldn't hesitate to take it out on any kind of professional assignment. So I really love these EM1X's guys. Thanks for watching. Hit me up with questions. Let's discuss in the comments, and I'll see you all in the next one.